Hey, Mason, did you get new glasses? Yeah, Jeff, kind of. These are old uh, frames, but I've got new lenses. My eyes, they're just getting older. Yeah, all of us keep getting older. Yeah, no kidding. Remember when we didn't have to wear these cursive things? Uh, I've been wearing glasses for 30 years, so I don't think about them a lot anymore. Man, I hate glasses. I hate that I have to wear them. They make me feel old and I get cranky. <laughs> I can see where this is going. They are a pain, especially when you're using a camera. Oh man, don't get me started. I really hate my glasses when I'm using my camera. Having bad eyes is a hassle. Dare I say it? They make life a little discombobulated, but I think we can photocombobulate this. Photography and our eyes can be complicated. Smudged glasses, dry eyes, blurry vision, geez. We're here to make things simpler. We're here to photocombobulate. I'm Jeff Carlson. And I'm Grumpy. Oh, I'm also Mason Marsh. <laughs> you know, Jeff, I took my eyes for granted when I was younger. I used to have perfect vision was something I felt really proud of. I could see road signs, you know, a mile away. <laughs> and I would, it was actually like a party trick. I could read things from across the room that nobody else could read. And when I went to take eye tests at the, at the doctor's office for my checkups, I would go all the way to the bottom and then I'd read like the address of the eye chart company. <laughs> <clears throat> it was something I felt like it was always going to be that way for me. That even though there were other parts of my health that probably would deteriorate. I was always going to have great eyes until, well, I didn't. Until and you didn't. I started noticing that my eyes were getting blurry. And um, it's it's been frustrating adapting to a world through glasses. And I know that you've had glasses for a lot longer than me. And you've gotten used to them a little bit. I don't know. Do you hate glasses like I hate glasses? I don't hate glasses. So I was basically in the same boat through college. And then after college, uh, I realized that, hey, uh, the road signs far away were a little bit blurry. And that's when I started wearing glasses. And so I think I've been wearing them long enough that it's not a big deal. For me, it's just the, like in the last several years, my eyes have gone downhill a bit. So it's not like I just have one set of glasses now. I mean, like the ones that I'm wearing right now are ones that I specifically wear when I'm using the computer mm -hmm. because I have some progressive lenses that in theory are ones that I can also use the computer. But I found myself like working with my head lifted because I was trying to look out the bottom of the, the you know clear area when you're looking at something close and, you know, it, it, it was just a mess. So definitely things got more complicated. And then you add photography on top of it, where you're, you know, looking through either a small viewfinder or, or an LCD, and you've got the, the focus level on both of those and uh, all that. It's, it, <laughs> to me, it, it makes me feel so old and it drives me crazy. So I'm like you, I have, I have a set of glasses just for the computer. Uh, and sometimes I use them for reading, but then I've got my progressives, which are right here. I mean, I carry two, no, three pairs of glasses because I also have my prescription sunglasses. So don't oh, get right, me started right. on that. Oh, so yeah, I forgot I about sunglasses. To carry three pairs of glasses around. And so now it's it's like when I go somewhere, I'm like, okay, do I have my glasses? Do I have, you know, I feel like kind of stereotypical <laughs> old guy. Do I, did I take my meds? Did I have, you know, stuff? And it's so, only going to get worse. I mean, better. Uh, well, and it, it does. It does. It does seem like it's getting worse. My eyes, every time I go in for an eye test, I'm like, please don't get worse, please. And they're like, actually, it's not too bad. It's, it's the, yeah. about the same. So I'm feeling yeah, pretty yeah. good about things now. So here's the thing. We have a guest today who we can do. enlighten us about all this. He's been very nice and quiet and polite. Yes. But why don't you introduce who we're talking to? Yes, we are joined by Dr. Joseph Allen, who's also known as Dr. Eye Health on YouTube. He's got a great YouTube channel. Uh, I discovered him a while back in my quest to better understand my own eye health. Um, I've got a great optometrist who's taught me a lot, but I just wanted to learn more. I've got some things that I need to do. I have preventative maintenance that I have to do on my eyes. Um, 
And so I discovered his channel and I just, I just love his approach. And we reached out to him and he's here today. I'm so thrilled. We're so honored to have Dr. Joseph Allen. So just a little bit of background on him because um, I want to spend the time we have with him talking about our eye health, not necessarily <laughs> all of his accolades, but he is the... Um, he got the Media Advocacy Award from the American Optometrist Association last year, or this year. And uh, he is a practi practicing optometrist in Minnesota. And uh, I don't know how he has time for all the stuff he does, but he's obviously a very energetic guy and probably gets up at like 3 a.m. And, and does a full long day every day. <laughs> but Dr. Allen, welcome. Thank you for coming on Photocombobulate with us. Well, wow, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Mason. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, no, this is a huge honor for me. I was kind of mentioning to you guys before that it, this world of photography, videography, learning lenses, um, it's its really been helping me better understand, I think, even being a better eye doctor, uh, because I just got into this world of cameras like three years ago. Mm -hmm. And its it's helped me conceptually understand what my patients are seeing. And I have, I've always had a, just a love and respect for art and artists. And I've, I've been kind of just falling in love with photography and it's, it's not easy to learn. <laughs> At least I yeah. haven't, I don't <laughs> think it's something that you naturally just like, aha, picture, beautiful piece of art. And it's like, no, there's so much more thought uh, and processes to it. And just understanding the gear alone is is mesmerizing. So again, thank yeah. you guys so much for inviting me on this. I'm really honored. Wow. It's sure a pleasure to have you here. So I'm going to jump right into some questions because I want to, I want to learn as much as I can. This is an area that I feel like I, like I said, I just kind of came into it suddenly and I realized I didn't know what I thought I knew. And so I want to learn some more. Um, photographers, we obviously have a vested interest in keeping our eyes healthy. Um, so other than regular checkups, like I get my eyes checked every year. I don't know if that's the, what's suggested, but I just feel best getting them checked every year. Other than having kind of annual checkups, what can we do to preserve our vision? Well, first Mason, I'm happy that yes, you are getting your eyes checked every year. That is a big <laughs> aspect. It's not just about seeing your best. Cause some people like, Hey, you go see the eye doctor and they're like, fantastic. You see great. You don't really need glasses or they're optional. But there's a lot of health issues inside your body that show up in the eyes, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Uh, I had a girl with anemia last year that when I sent her for blood work, they immediately admitted her into the hospital because she could have like bled out at any moment. Oh my wow. God. Uh, there's cancers that show up in the eye, autoimmune diseases. There's, uh, and we'll catch them in the eye before they, people had any other symptoms. So it's, it's, there's a lot of other reasons to have your eyes checked every year. So again, I'm happy that you're getting that check. <laughs> uh, long story short, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things you can do to keep your eyes healthy, even from a younger age, but it's even more important as, as you do gain those birthday candles on the cake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mainly, I'm a strong advocate for uh, mainly diet and nutrition because mm -hmm. the eyes, being that they are the retinal tissue in the back of the eye, kind of like the the actual receptor chip inside your inside your camera it it is highly metabolic it it's actually extension of your brain mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of glucose and a lot of oxygen and it's constantly from the moment you open your eyes in the morning your eyes are constantly being bombarded by light energy and so that uses a lot of oxidative that ends up with a lot of highly reoxid oxidizing species and then you end up uh, with free radicals and your body has to regenerate and keep feeding that retinal tissue. So eating healthy, that's, uh, I know it's kind of like the doctor's answer for everything. Is it right? Um, you know, you go in and they get diagnosed with high blood pressure or diabetes or something. Uh, and they always say, you need to start eating. You need to go on a diet, you need to lose weight. And it's like, well, th that same story is true when it comes to the eyes. So other than carrots, right? We all know that carrots are good for your eyes. <laughs> other than carrots, what would you suggest as a diet to, to really kind of supercharge our, our eyes? So it's funny that carrots, uh, the whole concept of carrots being good for the eyes. Now carrots are good for the eyes, but they're not as like a super food for the eyes as people think. Uh, I think that from what I've heard is that the whole idea of carrots is, um, it's actually like a myth that was generated as propaganda in like World War One, World War II. Oh, wow. I'll have to I'll have to look and in, look into that and research it myself. But uh, in fact, 
if you were to buy a carrot, the leafy butt end of a carrot, or if you grew it in your garden, that would uh -huh. be better. <laughs> Green leafy vegetables are, they have antioxidants that are much better for the retina, specifically the center of your retina called the macula. Mm. That's like the, if you're playing darts, the center bullseye of your vision, that's called the macula. Mm -hmm. And within that area, you find two antioxidants, lutein and zeaxanthine, and they're in higher concentration in that part of the eye more than anywhere else in the body. And you get that mainly from eating leafy green vegetables. Wow. That's great. So, so the other end of the carrot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other end of the carrot. So going for spinach, listeners, do kale, not poke. arugula, your salads, all of that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Dear listeners, do not poke carrots into your eyes. This is not yeah. what we're talking yeah, about. We're talking about Just, all. you know, the standard legal disclaimer as your lawyer. Oh, wait, I'm not a lawyer. So, uh, you know, we know, so the, the leafy greens, great advice on lots of levels, but to know that it's great for my eyes is that much more of an incentive to eat them. Um, things that are bad to eat for your eyes. Now, my optometrist suggested that maybe too much caffeine was not a good thing for my eyes. And I immediately fired her and I went to a different optometrist <laughs> because coffee is, coffee is life. So go easy on us because Jeff and I both are, are huge coffee fans. Is our daily habit of taking in caffeine bad for our eyes? I would say maybe being oh. that there's no large studies kind of con finding that as a conclusion. Uh -huh. The, the whole so coffee might actually have some benefits to it. The, <laughs> the caffeine aspect, <laughs> the reason your doctor would suggest that with caffeine is because caffeine constricts your blood vessels. That's the reason why people are worried about it causing high blood pressure or contributing to it. Mm -hmm. The back of your eye, and what's beautiful about the eye is it has what's called a dual blood supply. So you have arteries and veins within the retina itself, but you also have these arteries and veins behind the retina called the choroid. And the choroid is a very tight meshwork of blood vessels. Imagine like 20 spider webs interconnecting, but they're all just supplying moving blood to the back of the eye. Huh. That Those blood vessels and the choroid, those ones constrict under caffeine. And there are some, it's transient, meaning maybe the caffeine, one study I remember reading, uh, showed about the caffeine level of one cup of coffee. It's about 100 milligrams of caffeine. Does constrict the blood vessels significantly for about four hours. Hmm. And we know with a lot of different retinal diseases, people who have thinner choroidal vessels, they it does associate with some retinal diseases. Hmm. So I've never seen direct conclusion like, yes, caffeine increases the risk of retinal disease. I've never seen that. Never heard mm -hmm. any doctors really talk about it. It's just something that's like weakly associated, but coffee does have a lot of antioxidants in it. So like tea, <laughs> coffee, they have lots of antioxidants. And so there may be some benefit to ingesting it, uh, always in moderation, right? You don't want to be sitting there pounding monsters or anything like that. I, I'm right. not a fan of energy drinks, but coffee, uh, tea, I love green tea, black tea myself. And I am a huge coffee fan myself too. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would imagine that it's also the type of thing where, you know, it, it, if you are ingesting vast amounts of coffee, I mean, just huge amounts of coffee, you're probably doing it uh, also to stay awake, to stay up late, you know, and, and so all of these things are going to compound, you know, your eyes are going to get dry because you're up so late because you've been staring at a screen because you had so much coffee, you know, so the moderation, I know in, in my own experience, so one funny thing about me is that long ago, my uh, I'm a, a freelance writer, and my my company name is Never Enough Coffee Creations, and I set that up at, at the very beginning because I didn't want to just be you know Jeff Carlson Incorporated or whatever, and and you know of course when I was doing that in my twenties, uh, I was drinking a lot more coffee, and at one point I I found that limit. Of uh, okay, this is too much coffee, and it, it it's it sort of wrecked me because I you know I just overdid it. I mean, I was drinking <laughs> six or seven espressos a day, and it, it it was it was crazy, 
And so, you know, even just recognizing that, all right, yes, it's good to have coffee, uh, but if you're going to overdo it, it's not just your eyes that are going to suffer. It's 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 going to be a whole whole raft of things. Because strangely, I think all this stuff is interconnected. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely, no. I love Strangely, that. Yeah. That's that's a great uh, that's a great like business company name. The Hutu, yeah, uh, <laughs> never enough. Uh, now I know what to send you for Christmas. That sort of thing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. There's never enough coffee, and then secretly, I know exactly when there is enough, and and I know how to recognize that. But um, in Jeff's defense, it was the '90s. It was Seattle. You know, it <laughs> yeah, went in Rome. True. Went in Rome. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Allen, I, I have another question I want to kind of dive into. Um, as photographers, we, Jeff and I both spend a lot of time outdoors doing photography. And one of the things that my optometrist encouraged me to do as soon as I got a prescription was get prescription sunglasses. She said, you know, protecting your eyes from UV lighters is super important. And as much time as you spend outdoors, um, you know, you really need to protect your eyes. Now, I... I've always tried to wear sunglasses, but when you're taking photos, you know, the, it doesn't work with sunglasses, especially polarized sunglasses. They're really, you can't see your screen very well. It's, it's a real hassle. So I you end up taking them off and putting them up on your hat or in your pocket or throw them in a camera bag and you forget. And then after a while you realize you've been squinting and, you know, help us kind of dial in a smart approach as photographers to protecting our eyes from UV light including and not including sunglasses as part of that? No, it's a really good question. And honestly, while you're asking it, I'm like, my brain was like running, trying to think of like, what options do we have? Mm -hmm. So uh, the main concern about UV light is not just the eyes, but also the eye, the eyelids, the eyelids being the thinnest skin on the body and it's higher risk of skin, skin cancers. In fact, uh, we see a lot of people with skin cancers uh, on the eyelids. The, other aspect of UV light, because you can get sunburn to the surface of the eye called photokeratitis. So if you're mm -hmm. ever out like, you know, swimming at a beach or at a pool and you don't wear sunglasses uh, later that evening, you might notice your eyes are more red or irritated. Mm -hmm. So that that's usually because kind of a mild sunburn on the eye. And then also sunlight getting into the pupil of your eye. It increases your risk of cataract formation as you get older. It actually will speed things up. There's certain types of cataracts. There's different types. And uh, one of them called cortical cataracts is directly linked to UV light exposure. So the uh, sunglasses issue with, with, especially with being photography, you, you hit it on the nail on the head. The first thing I thought it was like, oh, polarized glasses. If you get polarized sunglasses, you're probably not going to be able to see the LCD screen on your on your if you're using an, uh, a camera that has an LCD screen, which most modern cameras usually yeah. do now, yeah. uh, that might interfere. But of course, it's like it's like having a neutral density filter on on your eyes, so you may not be seeing the exposure quite right, or you know, depending on what you're looking for, it might it might interfere. The one easy answer, you know, especially um, if you can, I'm just thinking, okay, broad options for protecting the eyes. Yes, sunglasses will help. And if you get a prescription sunglass, you can ask for it not to be polarized. Mm -hmm. So you can get that. The wide brim hat option, wearing a hat is a good idea because uh, that's going to obviously protect any sunlight coming from up above. You may still get sunlight bouncing off water if you're shooting like a next to water, maybe bouncing up and hitting you in the eye. But I think wide brim hats, just the easy, cheap option. Mm -hmm. And then if your eyes can handle it, a lot of contact lenses these days have UV light protection built into them too. So that that might be an alternative. Okay, so if you're a contact user, you can get you know, some protection just by wearing your contacts if they're the right kind of contacts. That's great. I myself, I have progressive glasses, so I don't know if contacts are even a, an option for me. Um, I know Jeff has a thing about putting stuff in his eyes, so I know contact lenses aren't an nope. option for him either. I will so. never be able to do contact. Sorry, I, I just I it. I'm sure there's probably a technical term for it, but it it squicks me out. Uh, you know, just like some some eye stuff, I I, I just can't do. Uh, but but actually, this makes me think um, because at one point. I considered, you know, maybe I need to get the glasses that automatically uh, dim when you go outside, right? Um, uh, photo. So uh, 
photo gray lenses. Um, yeah. The yeah. the brand, the big famous brand in the world that makes them is called Transitions. Yeah. Uh, that's so that is an option, but mm -hmm. there's some pros and cons to those too, right? They yeah. as soon as you go outside, they're gonna turn dark. And then you want to go inside or you step inside your car, they're not gonna be dark anymore. Um they right. still may interfere with again that neutral density filter effect. Uh another thought too, if uh because sunglasses are great because they do bring your light sensitivity down, mm -hmm. but the UV protection benefit, you don't have to have those in like colored tinted glass sunglasses either. Just your regular clear glasses can have UV light protection built into them, whether it be just the nature of the plastic, like polycarbonate, or if it's uh, like CR39 and they have a UV light protecting coating put on. So there, mm. there are different options there. Yeah, yeah. I think the I think the thing that I would be wary of for a lot of these things is just that that sense of I, I want to make sure that what I am seeing is is the scene that I'm composing, and uh, you know th this this also comes up like if I'm editing photos at night, and I, I'm sure we, we can talk about this a little bit later. Um, you know the 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 screen shift technologies that are going to make things a little bit more warm so that the you know the light isn't as as stark and there have been a few times i'm i'm editing photos and i'm like oh this is like nice and golden i really love this and then i realize oh, i forgot to turn that off because it's 10 o'clock at night and then i switch it back to the regular mode and everything's a lot more blue and so it's just I want to make sure that I'm out there and and seeing what I'm seeing, so I don't come back and realize that oh, all all my shots I had set the wrong white balance because my my glasses were getting in the way. It's sort of like you know having having a filter on the end of your end of your camera. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true, and that's something that uh, I've came across in my like adventures and making YouTube videos. Yeah, uh, is actually even right now I'm sitting in front of two computer screens, and one computer screen is a little bit subtle yellow color, mm -hmm. where my laptop screen isn't, and I don't know which one is actually accurate anymore. <laughs> right. So I just have to pick one and say I'm just gonna I'm just gonna color correct everything to whatever this screen is showing me. <laughs> You know what? It all looks just fine. <laughs> I don't think nobody's watching my videos for like, oh, this color doesn't look natural. You know, no one's watching. That. <laughs> but there's probably in, like one guy out there who, who's like, he's like, oh, this guy's stuff is great, but he's like, his his tint is just like three points off. Yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, but I know if you're doing this professionally, if you put a lot of heart and soul into it, I can see how frustrating that would be. Um, mm -hmm. There are some. You know, so there are, of course, some glasses that do change tint. So uh, going back to the transitions ones we mentioned, thankfully, the, the technologies, if you're getting new transitions now, they work really well and they last at least five or six years or plus before they start having a subtle color change to them. Mm -hmm. But older transition lenses, if you ever get those photo gray technology, oftentimes after two, three, four years, you'll notice the lenses aren't perfectly clear anymore. Even mm -hmm. when you're indoors, they have a subtle yellow hint to them. Mm -hmm. So... That's one thing I would keep in mind as a, a photographer. Uh, now there's a big discussion about blue light and the concern oh, yeah. about blue light. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about, this tint change on your computer. Yeah, yeah. So thankfully, yeah, you do have to remember to either turn that off or you can have a separate pair of... Uh, like when I... I after 7 o'clock in the evening, I wear blue light glasses and if I happen to be editing at nighttime, then I'd have to remember, oh, if I'm color correcting now, I have to take them off and then color correct. Um, so that that is something you probably will have to just either remember or um, kind of give a reminder for yourself. But yeah, yeah, that's that is a yeah. whole other thought to it of how your own color vision perception um, would influence your your art. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that, that that's leading me to. One is, um, you know, my I've heard that everybody sees color a little differently. And obviously, as photographers, we're taught color theory. We, we study, um, you know, certain ways to purify a photo so that it doesn't have a color cast. But all that's to say, we don't know how people are going to see that photo when they get it on their, when, on their device, whether or not their eyes see it differently or the device is presenting it differently because of a color shift. 
aspect of that device. So help clear this up a little bit for me. Do we all see colors pretty much the same? I know there's some people who are actually colorblind, right? But is there a just a broad spectrum of how we perceive colors or is that a myth? No, technically we all do see colors slightly different, but the vast majority of us uh, see things relatively equal. Uh, okay. About 8% of men are red, green color deficient, uh, where they just, they kind of confuse the colors. Uh, true rod monochromacy, uh, where people see black and white, that's extremely rare. Mm. Um, but the vast majority of us do see relatively stable colors. Unless somebody's starting to get 65 older, they could be developing cataracts, which naturally has kind of a yellow blue filter hmm. as part of it. And yeah. so people don't see the colors blue as vibrant. And so uh, I can even tell if I have an older, uh, an older patient come in it's funny because they'll have like a one blue sock on and a black sock on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it's because they they don't see the difference. They don't see the difference. Interesting. And so people who get cataract surgery, especially after just having one eye done, because usually we don't do both eyes at the same time; we do just one. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll come in. They're like, "Whoa, everything is so much brighter," <laughs> like, uh, and and colors are so different. Uh, so it's that's that's always kind of a remarkable <laughs> a remarkable thing people will talk about. Wow. Yes, we we repaint the office every couple of days just to, yeah. <laughs> to throw make everybody it a little off. more vibrant. So one one thing I've noticed in our conversation here is we've kind of been favoring um, people who have eye problems, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, because that's obviously our bias. Um, I, I would like to step back just a little bit and talk to um, you know the younger people out there who don't have bad vision yet. Uh, <laughs> What other than eating right, right, which we've talked about and wearing sunglasses out in the bright sunlight, what are some things that if I could go back to my 22 year old self when I had perfect vision, what are some things that I could tell that version of me that would help me keep my eyes in better shape than they are now? <laughs> So the, the tough thing, the, I think we, I mean, the tough part is answering other than food uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, sunglasses. I do think just taking care of your body in general, exercise and sleeping well is good for your whole body. It's mm -hmm. good for your mind, uh, but definitely also good for the eyes too, uh, mainly because of blood flow and in reducing inflammation. There are just, this is kind of interesting thinking because I know we just mentioned color, there are research studies that go into supplements. Uh, now, when it comes to supplements and healthcare, and especially eye care, I'm pretty soft-spoken about supplements because I'm somebody who I really like concrete evidence in the research that supports it. Yeah. Uh, I, the, a lot of supplements out there probably usually don't, they have kind of a bad rap of not having a good support system for, for, claims that companies make. Uh, when it comes to eye care, there is very good research on what's called the age-related eye disease study or AREDS. And that's specifically for what's called age-related macular degeneration. So if you go to the store and you look at the supplement aisle, you'll see some for eye vitamins. Those are usually for sp that specific disease, macular mm. degeneration. Hmm. Now, if you're not diagnosed with that, there's really not great evidence to support that that will improve or delay any sort of disease. Once you have the disease, then it's standard of care to say, you need to start taking these. But there are a lot of companies and universities and eye care schools that are researching these other possible benefits, including, like I mentioned before, lutein, zeaxanthine, and one university, they published several different studies all about nutrients, and it was over time. It was patients, uh, placebo-controlled studies, you know, one group not taking uh, the medication, they're just given a placebo, a sugar pill. The other group study, they're getting uh, these vitamins every day for six months, 12 months, and they are just measuring, can you read the line? Can you read the bottom line? They're also mm -hmm. measuring contrast acuity, how well you see under dim light. They're also measuring your color perception and how well you perform on these tests. 
And with these studies, they are finding that pa patients who are scoring better for color, for contrast acuity. And uh, I know you guys uh, and anybody listening, if you're into photography and into, into video or using a camera, you kind of understand contrast a lot better than most other people. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can understand how that might not influence just your ability to read chart or letters on a chart, but also your ability to perceive the world around you. Um, and so now again, I am not sponsored by any of these companies that make supplements, but there are some studies on them. Uh, one company that I, I do know that was in this particular research that I'm, I'm kind of referencing, uh, that's from a company called I promise. Uh, they make a lot of different eye vitamins, but they'll, you'll look into it. And if you ever look on their website, they have different ones for different diseases, certainly macular degeneration, mm -hmm. but they have ones for like sports vision that athletes will take, uh, mm -hmm. to improve their perceptual ability. Uh, mm -hmm. and so you can look into those. And okay. if you are really serious about your vision, I would consider that, uh, protecting the eyes as much as you can. I think mm -hmm. diet number one. Supplements, maybe number two. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds great. Go so, ahead, Jeff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about focus. And I know, you know, again, this is based entirely on, on my own experience. But, you know, as I mentioned, I have two sets of glasses, one sort of for general driving, uh, whatever. And then when I'm sitting at a computer and I'm at a, at a fixed distance from something, I wear, wear these other glasses. And that seems to work for me. Um, but when I am out shooting, you know, we're, we're thinking of focus in terms of composing the shot, but I'm also thinking of, of the act of focusing. And I sometimes get frustrated because we have a, a few different things at play. So we have my eyes, we have my glasses, uh, which when I'm out, I'll be wearing uh, my sort of general purpose glasses. And I'm looking in the viewfinder and the viewfinder has a little focus control so you can dial that in. Well, if I am wearing the wrong glasses and I'm looking in there, everything's gonna be blurry. And so I'm either switching things around or I'm just making some educated guesses. And I guess the answer is, I mean, it almost sounds silly to suggest this, but if you have focus issues, like should I be getting a set of glasses for photography or is that taking things too far? That is a really interesting question. And I honestly have never had a photographer come in and request a specific pair of glasses for, for photography. It's probably uh, not a thing. It, it It's just born out of a frustration that I have because, you know, uh, on one hand, you're either looking through the viewfinder where you're trying to see everything that's in there. So you're you're maximizing your view, at least through one eye, and or you're looking at the LCD. But now we're at the point where, okay, I'm looking at the LCD. Do I have to, you know, stick it out at arm's length so I can see what's on there so that I can check my focus? Do I need to, you know, put it up really close to me? And it's it's <laughs> It's immensely frustrating, but I don't know if there's anything that I could do about it other than, you know, have a good set of glasses that will let me have those different zones of things that are far away, things that are closer. The, uh, so the real struggle that you're having now, um, and you'll have to forgive me, Jeff, I don't, I don't know how old you are, but just, uh, 51. 51. So, so you're in both, uh, you and Mason are facing the struggle of what's called presbyopia, uh -huh. which is your need for bifocals, progressives, um, multiple different focal strengths. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that is such a frustrating thing. And I know I'm, <laughs> I'm heading there soon too. So there, there's so much research going into this, even even new medications, even to try and reverse it or see mm -hmm. what they can do, so you don't have to rely on bifocals or, or progressives. Um, for people who don't know what progressive glasses are, they are essentially bifocals, but instead of having just distance and near focus length, they it's like having thirty different focuses and they're all blended together. Mm -hmm. 
um, for this scenario, knowing that are you primarily using the the viewfinder on your camera then? I actually much prefer the viewfinder unless I'm, you know, at, at a weird angle. Um, and I didn't know this. Uh, if you're looking through the viewfinder, is there a dial that you can adjust the focus of just the viewfinder alone, not necessarily the camera? There is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's usually just sort of like tucked on the side of, of, of most viewfinders. And so I imagine it's just got like a plus and minus lens in there, or it's just moving a, a, a magnifier forward and backward. I think so. Yeah. The, yeah, it's a, it's a dioptic adjustment. So it'll be a plus three to minus three range. Okay. So for that purpose, ooh, um, this is this is like making me like, I, I almost like want to <laughs> hold on to it and like figure well, it out myself. While you, well, while you think about it, I actually want to ask Jeff a question, Dr. Allen. Yeah. Um, it's funny, Jeff, you're saying you wear your glasses. I actually take mine off. This is one of the things that frustrates me about using a camera is be, with our mirrorless cameras now, our viewfinder is a screen in there yeah. and we can, we can review our photos. We can zoom in, we can check our focus. It, you know, really can do everything that the LCD screen on the back can do inside a light protected box. Right. Right. What's great about it for me is I take my glasses off, put them in my pocket and I use just the viewfinder as much as possible because I have it set up with a dioptric, dioptric adjustment so that it's clear. I don't need right. my glasses. Um, but then when I, you have to use the LCD. <laughs> Maybe it's a bad, like Jeff said, you're working low to the ground or a pie and you can't look in the viewfinder. Then yeah. I'm going to put my glasses on and I'm doing the progressive thing. <laughs> I've got my camera way up high, which is a standard problem. Got my camera way up high. The LCD is tilted down. I'm looking mm -hmm. up at it, but now I have to look way back so I can look at the bottom of my glasses where my, right. where my, my progressives help. I, and so I that's a weird one. I do have a suggestion for you, Mason, for that specific reason. Uh, so you may not be able to have progressive lenses like this, but they do make uh, what are called professional like bifocals or occupational bifocals, where at the top of the lens, you can have a bifocal magnifier put instead of at the bottom where you look down, it's at the top of the lens. So like a mechanic who's working on a car, they don't have to like do that exact thing you're doing all day. They can they can just look up and they have this separate bifocal at the top. Ah. So it'd be, ex yeah, it would be extremely <laughs> uh, unique, but you can order them. You usually mm -hmm. have to go to a local optical like ask your optometrist and their, their clinic if they can yeah. make those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I know they exist and I learned about them in school, but I have not, had to order them for anybody yet. So, but uh, yeah. that might be a solution for what you're dealing with. Yeah. And I should point out, we did not bring you on here to diagnose our specific <laughs> maladies. Help it's, us, kinda, help us. <laughs> it's a curious thing though. Um, it's, this is again, uh, uh, something that plagues so many people. And I love that you guys do have like a computer glasses because if you are on the computer, like a lot of photographers are, you're editing for hours and hours. That puts yeah. a lot of extra strain on your eye muscles and having that to be focused at the set distance of your computer uh, is really nice. So if you do have a nice computer setup, before you go in to see your optometrist uh, to get new glasses and you, you know, hey, I'm going to get a prescription pair of like computer glasses, mm -hmm. if you can, I mean, your doctor does a good job. I'm pretty good at, at judging where the computer should be, but... If you have a certain setup at home and you know your computer screens, how many inches away or centimeters away from where you're sitting, then that would help me even more. I could get it like dialed into the exact like small quarter diopter step you need. So nice. that, um, that would be kind of a cool tip for, for anybody who's thinking of going to see their eye doctor. It's like, just measure the distance of where your eyes are at, your glasses sit versus where your computer is. Yeah, that, that's what I did for these. This mm -hmm. actually brings up a really good question um, now that we've gotten into the editing portion. Um, not just the the health and, and being able to see, and we've talked about color, but what about uh, fatigue? Like, what can you do? I mean, I would love to just say, you know, it's been a couple of hours, I need to go rest. But there are some times when either I am you know, really sort of in the zone of working on something or I, you know, I, I need to be here for three or four hours and yes, I'll take some breaks, but you know, like, do I look into 
eye drops, which uh, also squidge me out, but I understand the practical benefits of them. Uh, you know, like, like eye fatigue, I think, seems to be a big thing that no one thinks about because they just power through, right? Yeah. I'm just going to be here for, for several hours and, you know, I'll catch up when I sleep or whatever. So what you're describing is a is an issue that we're seeing across the board, not just obviously photographers, but um, so many people's professions now are in front of a computer all day. It's yeah. hard to find a, a, somebody's job who doesn't involve a computer. And then students, like especially mm -hmm. since COVID, everybody's on the computer all the time, oh, yeah. all day. So a lot of the symptoms that you're describing fit into what's called computer vision syndrome which is a combination of eye strain, mainly from the sustained use of your eye muscles, focusing at a set close distance. Mm -hmm. I like describing it to people. It's like, pick up a 10 pound weight. You can hold it there for a long time, but you try to hold it there for like three, four hours. Eventually your arm's going to get tired. And so that's a big component of it. And that's why having prescription computer glasses, is beneficial and your doctor cannot just put magnification power to relax. There's a muscle inside your eye called the ciliary body it can relax that muscle, but there's also the virgins component of your eyes where your eyes have to come together and hold it at that position. And your doctor may find that using prisms in your prescription glasses could relieve some of that tension of converging your eyes together. Like have you ever seen like a five-year-old kid, like look at the tip of their nose and they bring their eyes together. Yeah. That's convergence. And most people do not use their convergence muscles like the most accurate or correct way. And so that may contribute to eye strain. The other aspect of computer vision syndrome, which you, you talked about it, Jeff, was dry eyes and maybe having to use eye drops. The aspect of dry eyes is that, they, and they've done studies on this, they find that in conversation, if you and I were sitting across the a table from each other just talking, we blink somewhere around 20 times a minute. But as soon as we read a book, and especially on the computer or a phone, we're so hyper-focused, our blink rate decreases by about four to five times. So wow. you, you only are blinking about four to five times a minute when looking at the computer versus a normal 20 some. So your eyes are open longer and your tear film, tear film evaporates. And so you end up with more dry, burning, gritty. Uh, occasionally your eyes are tearing. We'll have mm -hmm. patients come in. They're like, my eyes tear all the time. It's like, it's, it could be that there's a drainage problem, but it's more often than not that they're having experience of their body making more tears as a reflex to correct the problem of dryness. The, uh, the tough thing is, yes, there are different options. Yes, using eye drops, <laughs> if you can handle it. Uh, I suppose <laughs> for Jeff, if you, uh, you, have to, you have to inform me, where do you live, Jeff? Uh, in Seattle. Seattle. So, you know, Seattle is kind of rainy, so I don't know what the humidity level is like. Uh, but for some people, like where I live here in Minnesota, it's cold most of the, most of the year, and we have a furnace on. And yeah. the furnace, just the humidity level drop super low the air is yeah. so dry so having a humidifier in your office might help a little bit you know for some people and just making sure that things are comfortable mm -hmm. so uh so that might play a role making sure you don't have a fan or an air conditioner or anything blowing directly in your eyes that might be another kind of a good tip just to try to avoid any sort of evaporation yeah uh, increasing that evaporation on your eyes taking a break is important and remembering yeah. to blink more often uh, and to completely blink. That's the other thing. A lot of people don't blink 100%. They, really? uh, and this is, I, I have this problem too. Your eyes only will end up blinking about 70, 80%, and you leave this little sliver open. And that's because your eyelid comes down and it covers the pupil, and your brain thinks, oh, I closed my eyes. Wow. But it's like the shutter didn't completely close on the camera. Yeah. Uh, that's so weird. And, and so you end up with what's called exposure keratitis and the surface of the eye is constantly exposed to the elements and it dries out. And during an eye exam, we'll, we'll actually put this green fluorescein stain on the eye. And we can see this perfect staining of on the lower one third of the eye. And so it's kind of a telltale sign. I'm like, oh, well, they're, they, maybe they're even sleeping with their eyes. And that's another possibility. Too, yeah. But, wow. wow. 
I should also mention to all of our listeners that uh, I think we've probably blinked about seven times more often now. Yeah, just our eyes are well discussion. hydrated right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Allen, this is all just kind of blowing my mind. One of the things that one of you know to get really personal, one of the problems I have with my eyes is my eyes do get really dry, and there are days where I'll get to the end of the day and it, they are like popcorn. I mean, I just feel like I just want to close them and just sit there for a while you know, with my eyes closed. And I'm, I have very sensitive eyes when I go outside, they run, I get tears running down my face. I go on a walk and it looks like I'm listening to a sad book or something. <laughs> um, one of the things my optometrist talked about was not just the aqueous layer on my eyes, but the oil layer. And one of the challenges that I have is my eyes don't have a good layer of oil on them. And I had no idea. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's all brand new. <laughs> so she suggested make sure you're getting, you know, take some fish oil that might help, but take care of your eyelids. And I'm like, what? Take care of my eyelids. You know, I wear glasses. I take care of my eyes. She goes, no, you take care of your eyes, but you don't take care of your eyelids. And so I have this, and I know you've done videos on this. I, one of the reasons I went to your channel, this hot mask that I put over my eyes, I'm supposed to do it every day, but I don't, I'm not good about this. And I don't do it long enough now that I've learned from you. It's supposed to be 15 <laughs> minutes. I do it for like three <laughs> and I'm like, I'm good. But it's a hot mask I put in the microwave. It makes it hot and then I put it on my eyes. It feels awesome, but it melts the uh, kind of thickened oil ducts and along my eyelids and lets that oil out. So can you explain that? Because this was brand new to me and I feel like I, I, I'm a pretty aware person, but this was like learning Swahili. When I, I've when never I heard of this. this. This this is great. I'm so happy you bring this up because it kind of just ties into exactly what we were just talking about. Uh, so this is so what we're discussing is on the eyelids. There's these rows of oil glands, uh, and we call them the meibomian glands. That's the proper term. They're on both the bottom and the top eyelid, and they function. So every time you blink, and it's when you completely blink, okay. these oil glands release a little oil that coats the tear film it mixes with your tears but it it's it's like if you've ever seen oil float on the ocean or mm -hmm. like gasoline in a puddle it floats on the top right or if you put olive oil in like your boiling water if you're making noodles it floats on the top and so it prevents your tears from evaporating now this is this is something that i even as a you know first or second year up a student in optometry school you start learning about this and you learn what's called blepharitis or posterior blepharitis. Uh, as this is essentially inflammation of these oil glands and how these oils start to change. So it's supposed to run, like if you're blinking, it's supposed to run like a smooth oil, like olive oil would be. But think of it like butter. Imagine if instead of an oil, you try to get these glands to pump. You're gonna trigger Jeff squishing this now. <laughs> And it's that happens to so many people these days, and we're actually seeing an increase uh, amount of focus in eye care on this as part of dry eye and a huge contributor to dry eye disease. And we're it's you know when I was a student, I kind of learned it as almost like it was a normal thing that you see older individuals have this, and they've always believed it related to dry eye, but they didn't fully understand its relationship. But in the last probably 10 years, there's been a heightened awareness and focus as new technology comes out, we're able to measure these oil glands and actually see the effects of them. But uh, long story short, and I know I have a lot of videos and stuff on this, but yeah, Mason, when you're having these oil glands and they're clogging up and they're not producing well, and it could be that they're not producing good enough quality, or it could be that the quantity isn't good enough. And so then, yeah, your tear film, your, your oil layer thins out very quickly after you blink. And then again, it evaporates almost instantly. And so that's oftentimes the vast majority of people who have dry eye disease have forms of evaporative dry eye. And, uh, and the stinky thing um, about it is that even people who are young, we're seeing teenagers developing this condition as well. Mm. Uh, hmm. The reason for these oil glands having these issues is some can be somewhat genetic. It can be due to hormone changes. It can be due to medications, namely acne medications, because these are oil glands 
just like all the glands on your face. And so people take acne medications like Accutane and they end up killing these glands. <laughs> and then you, oh, wow. then, then you lose <laughs> wow. all those glands. Uh, but the big concern right now is because of our lifestyles on computer use going right back to how we didn't, we don't blink as much. Yeah. And if you're not blinking as much and you're not blinking completely, those oil glands are pumping. And because they're not pumping, the oils stay trapped in the glands and the oil goes rancid, kind of like it turning to a hard butter formation. And then you get inflammation, new blood vessels form and eventually the glands die. And so a lot of effort treatments going to keeping those glands working. Uh, hence warm compresses. That's a great, just, you know, easy lifestyle thing to do, but you know, working it as a habit, it's kind of like brushing your teeth twice a day. You have to just do it and do it and do it until it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. Um, but keeping the eyelids clean is a big aspect to it. And thankfully we have other treatments. We have medications, we have in-office procedures, uh, trying to not just help with MGD or my bone gland dysfunction, this oil gland issue, but other, mm -hmm. other forms of dry eye treatment help as well. Great. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's been a, it's been a game changer for me because I, I just didn't think that was a factor. I just assumed that when you blink your eyes, it just makes them wet. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. there was to learn that there's oil that wasn't producing enough of it, that I wasn't taking care of my eyelids. You know, I, uh, you know, living in the Northwest, I live in Portland, Jeff lives in Seattle. Um, smoke is a part of our world now <laughs> for a part of the year. Oh yeah. And I know the time I spend outside, these days in the summertime, you know, my eyes are burning when I come in and, you know, I'm stressing that. And so it's not just UV light. It's not just sunlight. It's atmospheric, you know, it's material getting into my eyes. So, uh, aside from all, we're making this long list, right. To keep our eyes healthy, right. We're going to eat right. We're going to get sleep. We're going to blink a lot. We're going to, uh, treat our eyes nicely, our eyelids nicely. We're going to protect our eyes. <laughs> all of these things. Is there anything we're missing in this? Oh my. Um, I love that you guys have touched so many different things. Uh, certainly when with smoke in your area that, I mean, you guys can't control a lot of that. It is true that if there is smoke uh, or allergies, if it's allergy season, your eyes are going to be more irritated. Oh yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can try to again use lubricating drops. There are anti aller or antihistamine uh, drops that are available too. Sorry, Jeff, I know you're not a drop fan. That's okay. Um, yeah, I know they exist. Oral antihistamines, you know, oral allergy Claritin that's over the counter that helps too. Except those medications also dry our body, so you may end up having more dry eye symptoms anyway. Um, you know, smoking. I hate. You know, it, it's it's been it's not a news. We know smoking isn't good for your health, but I know a lot of people, including some of my patients, who continue to smoke. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is uh, being an advocate. Um, so for my patients who do smoke, I tell them, I'm you know, you know, it's not good for you, but uh, if you do try to quit, and you need help, uh, talk to us or your primary care doctor. Get uh, we can get you therapy, medication to help you quit, things like that. Because uh, smoking is significantly affects not just dry eyes, but it damages the retina in the back of the eye and is the number one um, modifiable risk factor that increases risk for things like diabetes as well as uh, diabetic effects in the back of the eye as well as macular degeneration. So yeah, that's another thing. Um, Gosh, what else can we talk about? <laughs> annual, <laughs> annual eye checkups, right? Yeah, certainly yeah, annual okay. eye checkups, getting those checked out. Um, you know, just thinking about this, another thought, uh, two things, especially going back to, to Jeff and your questions about focusing and if there's other alternatives other than glasses, there, so the, as you guys know, in the world of, of cameras and lenses, like, you're always questioning like, where, where can it go next? How can they get better lenses? How can you get a crisper image than where it's at? Mm -hmm. The, in the world of eye care, there are constantly evolving technologies to improve things. And some of the best vision you can get better than glasses. A lot of the time are specialty contact lenses and I know, Jeff, you're like, no, <laughs> you're like, I'm not That's okay. That's okay. That. I can, I can tough it out for this. No worries. But at least consider this and anybody listening. Uh, if you have never seen that well with glasses, you just can't stand wearing glasses. The, 
the distortion effects. And I think as, uh, as photographers, you guys will understand distortion and what I mean by distortion better than anybody else, because uh, obviously a wide field lens versus uh, a more narrowed field lens, you you get the distortion effect in the periphery, right? Mm -hmm. And with glasses lenses, like uh, Mason, I think just looking at your glasses on the screen we're using here, uh, and maybe Jeff too, you might be a little bit farsighted. These are plus lenses. And so they create, uh, there's like a pin cushion effect where things get a little bit more distorted with contact lenses. You don't get that distortion because the lenses aren't in front of your eye. They're actually on the oh, eye man. and there's a tear film, a layer of fluid behind this lens between the lens and your eye. And it negates a lot of these, uh, distortion effects. And so people who have diseased eyes, like a condition called keratoconus, or if you have the uh, the terrible astigmatism that everybody gets diagnosed with, uh, contact lenses, specialty lenses, either hard, what are called rigid gas permeable lenses, hybrid lenses, which are soft and hard lenses combined, or scleral lenses, they can be made that negate these distortions and even improve vision where it's like, you're not just seeing 2020, but you're seeing a crisper 2020. And <laughs> there, again, there's always technology coming out, especially in the world of these scleral lenses, they, uh, they have multifocals. So although you may have press biopia and these uh, pro you know, progressive glasses, they also do have multifocal contacts. Wow. And in these scleral lenses, they're able to correct for higher order aberrations. And they are more difficult to fit. So you do have to often find an eye doctor who has experience or is a specialty uh, clinic where they this is all they fit and it's all they do all day. Um, and they are going to be more expensive. They, you know, the, the lenses usually go for at least a thousand dollars. Like the cheapest ones are about a thousand dollars. Um I'm, I'm guessing these stay in your eyes for a long time. They can. And they can yeah. be used to treat dry eyes. So uh the but again, you need to find a doctor who's experienced with them um, and is willing to work with you to, to get it dialed in just right. But I think for people who can handle contacts or interested in giving it a try, it, it might be a great option uh, wow. because then you wouldn't have to deal with the whole with the bifocal oppressed biopia up and down thing. Um, you may help improve some of the dry eye aspect. You might even just improve the clarity of your vision. So again, not for everybody, but yeah, I just wanted to throw it out there as another technology. Well, uh, and as fascinating. photographers, then you wouldn't be taking your glasses off to use your camera, right? You could also <laughs> buy regular sunglasses. You don't have to buy yeah. those expensive prescription sunglasses. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Nice. That is so cool. Well, Dr. Allen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to take me like three days to process all this. Stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate your time. Um, I want people to know where they can find out more uh, because you are a wealth of information, your YouTube channel, which we've mentioned. I would love it if you could tell people how to find that. Um, also some of the other services that you offer. Well, uh, again, thank you. Uh, so primarily a lot of just free information, public health stuff that I put out is mainly on YouTube. If uh, anybody watching this goes to Dr. I health on YouTube uh, or just start searching, you know, how to put in contact lenses or questions about dry eye, uh, chances are you'll, you'll see my face show up. Uh, I also do use Instagram. I don't, I do have a Twitter. I don't post much on there, but it, there are some people who reach out to me. Uh, otherwise I do still see patients every week. Uh, I work in Minnesota at the Pinecone Vision Center in Sartell, Minnesota, which is like almost dead center <laughs> in the middle of the state. Um, but still, if anybody is a photographer in Minnesota, I'm happy to, happy to help you out. That'd be great. nice. Well, thank you so much. It's it, you have been our first guest on this podcast and I, I don't think we could have done better in finding a great guest to give us lots of great information. You definitely helped us photocombobulate this subject. What do you say? Yes, Jeff? indeed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for, for being on. So a couple housekeeping guys. things. Um, we'll put in the show notes links to uh, Dr. Allen's YouTube channel and, and his other websites uh, so you can stay in touch and, and follow him. Please subscribe to his YouTube channel. It is uh, a constant source of great information. Um, 
We have this podcast on YouTube as well, so we can find us on YouTube. Uh, just look for Photo Combobulate. We also are available on all of your favorite podcast apps, um, but the site that I'd like you to visit is photocombobulate.com, where you can find the show notes for this episode, uh, and you can leave comments. So this is the spot to give us feedback on this particular topic and start a conversation. Um, we would also ask, since we are a new podcast, we'd love it if you could share a review and a rating on whichever podcast service you use. That helps uh, increase our reach and get more uh, subscribers, which we'd love to have. It makes our time that much more satisfying. All right. Yes to all that. <laughs> yes to all that. All right. Thanks. Thank all you, right. Dr. Allen. We sure appreciate it. And we'll, we're going to have you back sometime because I think we just got started. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate all of this. Mm -hmm.